Hello. There we go. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon panel on blockchain and the world's problems. We have many problems in this world. And obviously, you can change it by um, making lots of money with Bitcoin, something like that. <laughs> um, so we have a panel. Um, there's Jonas. He's right here. Um, there's Hongpuk as well, over there. Um, Cherry, I believe. Uh, Jolin. And Liu. Liu. Oh, he's not here? Cancelled. <laughs> okay. Oh, we've got you instead. Oh, okay. Roland's doing, doing it instead. <laughs> um, and they're going to discuss how we can do really horrible things with blockchain to make the world better. So, horrible things with it, of course. So, everyone, have a good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Do you have, did you have a good lunch? Yes. Happy. Awake? Not happy, but awake? I hope so. So, um, I just want to do a quick introduction about uh, the panel. Okay, so I have a little here. Blockchain, it is a hype technology. In this panel, we want to know what are real, real, real use cases of blockchain apart from the hype. Uh, as you know, in Singapore, recently, for the past few months, every day in Singapore, in the evening when you go out, it's always about blockchain. A lot of meetup, a lot, a lot of events going on here in Singapore, uh, and it's always full of people. So it is, um, uh, um, it is a hype here, or uh, in Chinese, they call Hun Kuo. Is it correct, Julian? Hun Kuo. It is something that uh, really hot at the moment. Yeah. But uh, what we actually want to know. Can blockchain solve any problems of the world? The panelists today will provide an insight into their projects and plan for the using of blockchain. Most of blockchains are using false infrastructure to mine and run their network. What is the role of open source in the projects and companies of the panelists? How does the open ecosystem benefit from the train of blockchain technology? In Force Asia, our goal is to improve people's lives in, with open tech. Technologies like blockchain raise the question about the impact on people and in the world. It takes a lot of energy to generate blockchains. There is no Im immediate benefit except of the coin itself. There is no immediate value product or anything a human could use except for the transactional value. What should be the stake of your social responsible organization in regards to these questions. Can blockchain solve the world problems and which ones? Before we start the panel, I would like to um, introduce our panelists again. As some of you would not hear. So let's see. Okay, so we have here Jonas von Moloski at Key. So um, he was uh, a keynote speaker yesterday for the opening about uh, open source uh, within Damlo. So I, um, if you don't mind, I would like to say again your uh, a short bio so the people here can also uh, understand your background. Then. So Jonas holds a diploma in computer science and Jap uh, Japanese study from University of Bonn. The main focus topics are metadata, data quality, as well as neural networks. Within Damlo, he was holding architectural roles for finance system in various leadership positions. His, he has a keen interest in new technologies and open source movement. And in his current role, he is shaping the blockchain and distributed pleasure technology activities from the technology perspective within Damlo. And Jonas is also a member of the governing board of Hyperledger. Uh, the second panelist I have here, Roland Turner. Most of you, <laughs> this is a picture of from, from Lynn. It's my LinkedIn photo. It's never used in this context, so awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so serious. <laughs> yeah. Most of you probably knew him as one of the organizers of Force Asia, but apart from, from that, Roland is the chief privacy officer of Trustfield. 
where he is responsible for the company's information policy and practices made in Singapore. He's also a founding member of the hackerspace. He holds a computer science degree from University of Technology, Sydney, and he is an avid dancer. Well, I knew him for the past five years and seen you dance even once. Yeah. And he's a runner and also a ham radio operator with a particular interest in space. The two panelists I have, um, let's see, I have uh, Jerry Matthew. So Jerry just arrived today from KL, I would say. You are on time. Thank you. <laughs> Jerry is a C programmer uh, with a geo liberation political views, uh, anarchist and atten a tendency and some false contribution mostly to the, I, I believe, free BSD operating system. Not the ideas. Okay, good. And uh, as a software engineer, he has written programs which are mostly user invisible. Yeah, do something that nobody can see, right? As a hardware engineer, he has built an autonomous fruit picking robot which was very user visible. And he also a founding member of two hacker conference, Hack Beach and Hugh Hacks India. Yeah. The two panelists I have here. Okay, so treat this. Okay, so this is um, Jolin Chen. Jolin is a creator and blockchain architect of Flowchain.io, an open source based IoT blockchain solution. Before Flowchain, he has been working on embedded software and full stack web development for many years. His research interests uh, distributed lecture technology and IoT data security. Jolan holds a master's degree in manufacturing information and system from the National Chang Chung University of Taiwan. Welcome. Okay. So let's start with the question of the day. I would like to start with um, the first two questions for the panelists here. Uh, what is your interest in blockchain? And if your company are currently doing, to do, uh, doing something with blockchain? Who would like to start first? Jolan, I see. Most qualified. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so what is, could, you, could you explain a little bit about your company and what are you currently doing with blockchain? Uh, okay, I got to read. My name is Jordan. Um, I own a small business both in Taiwan and China. So I realized that the IoT industry, especially in China, uh, needs a visible solution of IoT blockchain. Um, however, uh, although there are already blockchain systems uh, such as Hyperledger and Ethereum, but these blockchain systems cannot fit the needs of the IoT industry. Uh, so I left my position of, of the last company to start my own blockchain company and have a blockchain system denied from the ground up have to fit their needs of the IoT industries in uh, Taiwan and China. So I like the tab. Uh, it's because there are so many problems that we cannot still solve them. Uh, so I came here especially to learn from you about the problems um, and the solutions. So I have a, a very broad range of interests. I'm not active in any blockchain-related activity at present. I am extremely interested in what the various blockchain capabilities, in fact, it's three separate capabilities, if I get put under one umbrella, what they mean for technology, for market development, uh, and especially what they mean for open source and free software uh, and the associated how we make money at this thing. So there's a, 
it because of the te the default open the tendencies of the open source community and the default open tendencies of blockchains, I intuit a big overlap. But I, I don't yet have a, a specific application that I'm pursuing. Uh, you said that you're extremely interested in blockchain and you're currently not working on any application, but is there anything that you've seen uh, in the recent setting that... I think there's a general category of things. Um, so I, I, I'm not a fan of proof of waste. I, don't, I think it's a... So the basis of Bitcoin and currently Ethereum is a terrible idea. Um, money is, is about the, the ability to obtain a present, to turn a present day token into future day value. And so things that, can, that computation can measure, computation, storage, uh, communication and power, the future delivery of those things is a direct valuable thing that can be turned into a coin. So like, this is a very broad category, and I, but I think certainly for IoT it'll come up and a bunch of other categories, a bunch of other areas the idea of issuing tokens that are tied to future delivery of things that are economically valuable and can be measured by a machine uh, is going to be an absolutely compelling class of uses for blockchains. How that looks today, I can't guess. But I don't think proof of waste is a proof of work, if you like. But, uh, so, uh, sorry, that needs justification. You, you, you're looking for any uh, cryptocurrency of any sort. You're looking for proof that work either has been done or will be done. The category of work that is currently most popular is proof of intentional waste in the past. That, that's Bitcoin, is, which is a, is a derivative of uh, RPRW, which is a derivative of hash cash. It's, it's, it's a long transition to this thing to prove waste in order to eliminate certain kinds of uh, abuse. That's not the only kind of proof of work that matters. So when I make the distinction, I'm not just insulting it. I am saying that although proof of work is important, proof of waste as an example of proof of work is a terrible idea. And it, and it will not sustain. It's that if you, even the, if you try to move the, the credit card transaction uh, volume onto Bitcoin, you would need more power than is generated on the planet. So it's yeah, that's that thing will at some point become rational. But I really do believe that there are a whole category of things where future will be valued that machines can measure mm -hmm. will have direct application for blockchains. Thank you very much. So Jerry, so we had a conversation before. So we had now Jordan doing some blockchain um, application for IoT, and Jordan also mentioned a few potential. But you told me before that you don't believe that blockchain have any positive impact. What are you gonna say now? Could you talk a little bit about your uh, motivation, <laughs> interest? <laughs> Gotta be careful speaking to you, <laughs> HP. <laughs> We, we try to give a positive atmosphere. Sure. Um, before I start, maybe I should give a bit of back, uh, background. I'm one of the guys who um, heard about the Bitcoin in 2009, early 2009, um, at a point where you could really run your home PC and you know be a millionaire now. Uh, and I deliberately stood, uh, you know, stood by. I had the you know the programming skills to get on board, uh, but I deliberately stood by the wayside and you know saw that train go by. Um, uh, but the, the real context, um, apart from that, is that I'm a kernel programmer, and um, a kernel is a very complicated distributed system, if you like, and the core technology behind blockchain uh, really derived from Lamport's work uh, way, way back. Uh, and, uh, you know, I looked at it as a technology project, uh, so I'm coming at it from a, uh, a computer science angle, uh, and also, I ran a hackerspace in a rural village in India uh, for two years uh, and helped start a hacker conference. So, have been hearing lots and lots of chatter about, about various kinds of technologies. And so, I'm coming at it with the eyes of a critic. Um, I don't want to take a particular position uh, right now, but uh, maybe as the conversation uh, progresses, I'll make my views more clear. Thank you very much. How about um, Jonas? So within Lambda. So my, my, my first contact was a little bit later than yours. It was 2010 when a friend came to mine and said, you have to do it. This is like insane genius. Yeah? And I thought, you know, this guy has super crazy ideas. So uh, interesting concept. And I was looking at the technology at that time. Yeah? But um, nevertheless, I missed it to buy or actually invest into hardware to mine something. Yeah? Um, then several years later at work, uh, somebody, uh, and I was t 
talking about that technology and somebody came around the corner and we, we have to do something with it. Yeah? We have to do a project. Yeah? I was like, yeah, I know something about it, so I want to do, I want to help. And then it went really crazy because everybody, then the hype kind of started. And now um, what we are doing is uh, we're investing in POCs, pilots, whatever, in terms of using the technologies for, for enterprise grade uh, applications uh, and also um, I, I try to demystify actually a lot of the fuss and the hot air about the blockchain hype at the moment yeah? and I try to, to bring it down to a ground and try to find applications that are really um, that you can really set up with blockchain, yeah? that you can really do with blockchain and not just put a label on and say, yeah, it's blockchain because it's the hype now. So are there any real application that you are using right now in, in the company? Or uh, yeah, I mean, yesterday I showed one thing is where we, that's not a world problem, let's say like this, but it's a small problem. So driving not very efficiently, yeah, we are trying to solve, uh, what we're actually trying to, to achieve is to change behavior. Yeah? So due to means of incentivation, something very abstract, a cryptocurrency behind that, uh, we try to incentivize if you drive greener, yeah, and then you probably also pollute a little bit less. Um, nonetheless, if you have a big car, then it's not fair to say that. Yeah? But uh, at least try to, to change behavioral aspects with incentivization, which is totally abstract, because nobody knows what to do with it now, at the moment. That is one of the projects. Yeah. So I want to go back to uh, uh, Jolan. Could you explain a little bit more as a user perspective? What can they do with the flow chain? What are the, the services that you offer? Okay. Uh, for me, most of the blockchain technologies are especially for fintech, uh, insurance, P2P, uh, peer-to-peer payments. And however, there were no blockchain technologies for IoT devices. So the Fortran started in 2015 to develop a IoT blockchain system. Uh, you can say, say Fortran is an embedded system over the operating system for devices. So uh, we have already developed uh, IoT applications. The application is a uh, video surveillance system which must uh, ensure uh, real-time transitions. For example, there it's about 30 frames, video frames in a second. Most of the uh, existing blockchain systems cannot fit our needs. Uh, for example, Ethereum has a about 10 seconds transition time. And Bitcoin is much longer, about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And for Hyperledger, uh, Hyperledger uses the trusty communication channel, which is not uh, so good for IoT systems. Uh, it's, it's because for IoT systems, the device needs to use a untrusted communication channels. Uh, it, it's in the perspective of uh, technologies. So um, maybe I can explain uh, things uh, in a little bit uh, by tomorrow in my session. Uh, yeah. When is your session tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I yeah, have a session tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so uh, is your application open source? For sure. Yeah. For sure, open source. Yeah. Well, not for sure, not, not sure. all the application <laughs> open source. Okay, so we come to the next question. So how are you using force with the technology? So, how FOSS, I mean, uh, I wouldn't trust any blockchain implementation that is not open source, yeah? because it's about, first of all, trust, and if you cannot trust the source of it, yeah, why should I trust the system then? Yeah? So, I think um, always if I explain also blockchain bringing together, actually all of the ideas existed before, yeah? but bringing that together in this, 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 completeness was was really ingenious yeah and uh, also I try to explain the people that um, it's not a technology you just buy 
and do something with it and you just tell some supplier you do like this yeah? it's a technology you have to embrace because it in in many ways may change also your business model yeah? and um, if you don't understand your business model you're basically fucked yeah? so you you should yeah you should embrace it in a different way but still there will be applications where you don't have to understand the technology behind that yeah? because it won't affect your business model um, so, in, in a sense, I mean, I see open source as the, the very, very basic foundation for doing actually blockchain, um, but not all applications on top of that have to be like then um, open. Yeah? Um, but going back to also solving uh, some of the problems, yeah? um, if I think about a lot of ideas that are currently evolving around solving identity problems, yeah? Uh, I haven't seen the killer application yet, yeah, because I always think there's, I, I even coin it the identity crisis, so because the question is how do you can, how you can really trust that you are you yeah, and I'm I'm, yeah, and uh, if we do transactions, nevertheless, some, some transaction, I give you my uh, house, yeah, <coughs> or I give you money and you lose your private key for something yeah who has the right to give it back yeah and who is the right or, or is it the community or however you may call it yeah and if uh, a device an iot device stores some information in the blockchain how can you really be sure that this iot device is really this iot device and not the the communication has been tampered with even if the if the code or a, like a private key is embodied into the cpu with a Spectre and Meltdown, we know that you might even attack those. So, um, yeah, I think that is one of the, the core problems still, but I mean, I think in general I'm not a critic. In general, I'm uh, not, I'm positively, but not overly enthusiastic. Um, I okay, so I don't want to object, but I, I want to... I want to kind of point out that a lot of the uh, identification, privacy related, like any place where you see a big institution, be it government, bank, whatever. The other day there was a very interesting paper by Accenture that said that there's something called a mutable blockchain. Go look it up. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, where I'm coming from is to say that we, the way um, this narrative is going on, uh, both in the uh, crypto anarchist uh, uh, world and in the rest of the world which is trying to make sense of all this stuff um, is that everybody's anonymous and everybody uh, you know transacts privately and so on and so forth we, we live in the real world with real relationships where you know the physical person is much much more vulnerable uh, you know uh, than people sitting you know behind terminals imagine they are you know co computers i mean geeks have the sense of invulnerability sometimes when you sit behind black and white terminal you know you can get control of it, whatever right um but that's not the case we're really vulnerable and we live in uh, social networks that are really strong and have uh, serious consequences you know how we set it up so again just to come back to the point where i feel like we're really marching into a rat trap um if we're going to put all our stuff out on a public ledger uh, Actually, in, in the blockchain space, the most sane um, technology that I've seen is Zuko's uh, Z Cash, I believe. It's called uh, Zero Knowledge Proofs. Sorry, Zero Knowledge Proofs. That's, yeah, that's Z Cash. Z Cash, yeah. That's, that's, in my opinion, that's the um, sort of best. Um, it's also a thing where I often argue about. Yeah? Uh, if people tell me we have to store this and this on the blockchain, I say, like, okay, that, let's, let's think about that. Yeah? If we, for instance, put prices of bananas on the blockchain, it might be okay. And now we have cryptography that at least hides it for the next few years. Yeah? And then at some points we might have cryptography that unveils the prices of bananas maybe 40 years ago. That might be okay because nobody cares then about the prices of bananas at that time. But if you put your health records on it, yeah, we shouldn't do that. Yeah, we should be very scarce with this kind of information, putting it in an immutable thing. We, we, might, we might also think twice about putting financial transactions on it. Yeah. Might, yeah, but oh. might not be so sensitive than uh, like real information about 
you very personal things. Yes, this is a sort of observation for those who have perhaps the, the crypto anarchist uh, mindset and are thinking, hooray, we have a, you know, a monetary system which is anonymous. Well, no, we don't. We, we have a monetary system which has a perfect, indelible public record of every single transaction that's happened. When Bitcoin, if Bitcoin gets big enough to be used for significant financial crimes, then prosecutors are going to invest whatever they have to to perform ordinary anti-money laundering, but with the aid of a perfect record of every transaction that's ever occurred. <laughs> it's a slam dunk. <laughs> okay, so next question. Thank you, Roland. Okay, uh, continue with um, talking about false. How does the open source ecosystem benefit from the trend to the blockchain technology? I think in, in many ways, open source movement um, now benefits from the hype. Yeah? So, because, I mean, if I think about enterprises there, yeah, people start to understand that this is a thing that you just cannot really buy and, and go and maybe you have a supplier that you can do. but. I mean, if it's not really open, then you are usually missing the point and a lot of people won't try to be a partner. Yeah? And if you have to partner and have to, to um, again, it's about the trust thing, and if you have to establish trust between partnerships and you have to use the software and it's open source, then for the, I think for the very first time, a lot of people will actually think about this kind of uh, technology. Jolene, any input on that? I, again, this is more an intuition than a, uh, than a concrete view, but the fact that, uh, at least at present, a lot of blockchain-based applications default open. I mean, there are uses of Hyperledger that are inside closed networks, but a lot of the, the interest is in applications which are default open with respect to the content of the, the distributed ledger. That happens to be the same behavior that open source and free software developers uh, exhibit. So at a very high level, uh, it is my intuition that there will be situations where the fact that those two things go together mean they'll be well aligned. And that there'll be things that open source communities can use blockchains for that closed communities might have trouble. So I suspect a, a, a synergy, but I don't have concrete examples yet. Um. By the way, thank you very much for leaving the middle chair for me. It makes thing quite complicated for me to 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 bond to the panelists. Actually, I should sit on the what is sit on the side. But thank you very much, <laughs> Jerry. I, uh, you have anything to add on the using of uh, force and open source ecosystem benefited? Well, uh, two two things broadly. I think uh, I think I do agree with. Uh, Role, right? um, that this whole Bitcoin publicity has really brought the idea of the uh, sort of open source geek, if you like, uh, to be a, a bit more sexy. Uh, so, <laughs> so I think that's 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 good in many ways, uh, and not taking any gender positions here, uh, but. Uh, uh, I think that's really nice because I've actually been a road warrior to take uh, free and open source software about a decade ago in my home state of Kerala and I walked 1,400 kilometers over 40 days just to talk to school children about FOSS. Uh, and a lot of the conversations that came up was about uh, how do you make money out of this? How do I get a job? Uh, you know, these are very fundamental questions, you know, uh, in, in the um, not first world that um, you know, it's about food and, and surviving. Uh, and so from that perspective, I feel like um, if more and more people are somehow by accident drawn into FOSS uh, just because of the publicity of uh, blockchain um, and Bitcoin and so on, uh, that might be a really good thing. But um, I want to help HP out a little bit here with the, the, good, the, 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 good, the good, good yeah. parts. I was at a conference last year um, where um, a room full of really public uh, bureaucrats in India. We, we, in India, where I'm from, we um, have this new identity scheme called Aadhaar, which I will not talk about right now. But um, anyway, uh, in that context, there was somebody who showed up from uh, somewhere in Latin America. Uh, I do not want to say the wrong uh, country. But anyway, 
they were looking as a government uh, at using the blockchain to implement contracts. So they, 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 were, they were looking as a government to um, implement, um, I'm not sure what the, what the mining scheme was or, who was or what blockchain particularly they were interested in, but as a government, because the person who spoke was a bureaucrat and he understood contracts and uh, the government position on contracts and um, sort of, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues, legal and legislative and so on and so forth. And that conversation seemed quite interesting because for the first time I actually saw somebody who was a bureaucrat, you know, who was in government, uh, not necessarily dealing with technology, um, you know, from a practitioner's point of view, actually um, talking about using this technology at scale, at the scale of an entire country. Uh, and I'm not sure what position to take on that, but I felt like that was a really positive thing. What was the uh, intended use? Um, was this for all government contracts, all contracts, a change in contract law to require it? Or was the um, I believe they were looking at um, the, the, the implementation or digitization of um, the function of what in India is called a registrar. So the government would uh, uh, sort of... It's sort of um, uh, you know, credibility. So I'm the government and I uh, vouch for the fact that this contract was signed. Uh, so the equivalent, they wanted to automate it using blockchain so that then the costs and so on were going to come down. This has some intriguing history and I was unaware of uh, that use. Certainly in sort of the ancient world, and I'm thinking ancient Athens, a contract was unenforceable unless it had been uh, witnessed and possibly even archived by a public notary. There was the concept of private contracts that were secret was invalid. You could not go in front of a court, which was basically a jury, and demand enforcement of a contract that had not been registered. So we, we now use it for land titles and births and deaths and a, and a handful of other things, but this is for all agreements. I think in public space there's also uh, something like a real registry. Yeah? If, if you have, um, for instance, uh, a housing uh, and, and you, you buy a house, you usually you just buy putting like, your name, put like the other name strike through and you, you, you buy your name putting on the, on the public something registry. Yeah? Something like this could also be a, a public application of this kind of thing. These are really compelling. Uh, if you've got, so Indonesia, part of the problem with Hayes has been that there are three overlapping and inconsistent property land title systems in use in yeah. Indonesia. So part of the difficulty several years ago when the Hayes got a bit exciting in this part of the world that the burning of um, uh, peat moss in order to plant palm oil turned the sky in this city opaque. You couldn't see 20 meters. Um, yeah, they don't have a consistent uh, state-run land title registry. In fact, they have up to three overlapping ones, and they're not consistent. The other issue you have in some places, I don't know if this is true in Indonesia, but uh, it's certainly the, the places where it is in the case, is you've got corrupt officials who are manipulating the, uh, the registration transactions, either to improperly benefit themselves from a transaction or in order to seek a bribe not to. And so in these cases, um, yeah, a, pu a public indelible record of a public transaction, which is what a land transaction is, seems like a really compelling application. But that, that was the question in my mind was, if you cut the costs of contract registration, there may in fact be arguments for increasing the scope of the public registration of, of contracts with critical events. So I, it's it's bit woolly, but I, there are one of the issues that comes up in in contract law is questions of contract formation. Does this contract exist? One party says yes, one party says no, one party says this was the document, one party says this was the document. That document's been tampered with. If you sort of eliminate that entire category of disputes, you cut the cost of uh, entering into, negotiating, and enforcing contracts. Uh, that has social benefits. That, of course, leads to the question of who's going to run the mining service. Is it going to be the government themselves monopolizing? The question or? is, what kind of consensus mechanism are you employing in the blockchain? Then? Yeah, so yeah. it doesn't have to be proof of work, which is also one of the myths that everything is proof of work and you're just burning energy. Yeah? Um, uh, the, the question is, what kind of consensus mechanism? I mean, proof of work at the moment is the, the best proven one. Yeah? and there's the most consensus about this consensus mechanism, maybe. Yeah? Um, but the question is, are there others? And if there are others, and there are others, yeah, but if 
are those also as trustable as proof of work at the moment? We don't know. Yeah, we will have to research a lot. But um, I think there will be difference. I mean, Sawtooth has proof of elapsed time, and now they have like a mechanism where you can just exchange uh, the consensus mechanism. Uh, but I think there might be others as well. Yeah, and I mean, if you talk to governments, proof of authority, I am the one, yeah, or I, at least some of the ones decided that this is okay, then this is okay. This could also be one of the applications of the uh, different consensus mechanisms. I'd, I'd point out a, a concrete example that already exists and is already having major economic consequences, and that's uh, TLS certificate transparency. So almost every browser, web browser in use reports the TLS certificates or the SSL certificates that it encounters to observatories. Mm -hmm. and there are or to, to, uh, blogs, there are three or four running. Um, what it does is means that CAs who misbehave get caught immediately, like within seconds of the first uh, misuse. Uh, this takes away a whole category of abuse by CAs. And in fact, it has also caused Symantec to have to exit the market because they were caught twice issuing fake Google certificates, apparently for legitimate testing purposes, not for criminal purposes, but like it shouldn't have happened once and it definitely shouldn't have happened twice. So that there are other mechanisms already in use in the world today that are not centralized, that are not government controlled, but have some of the same character that make it um, infeasible for certain kinds of either erroneous or corrupt behavior to go undetected. And, and this kind of, of mechanism which is lying behind that, uh, you can also use for, for different things. I mean, there was this one project which is called Everledger, which is basically about um, tracing diamonds, yeah? so, which is a high available good. Available good. Um, uh, and, and usually you buy diamonds in, in rich countries. Yeah? And um, they are usually created or at least extracted from the soil in, in quite poor countries. Yeah? And um, so there's a problem if you go for exploitation uh, to actually prove that this diamond has not been, is not a blood, blood diamond actually. Yeah? And one of the reasons you can do it because it's, first of all, diamonds always have like a DNA, yeah? so can you really prove this diamond is kind of this diamond and you can prove it on the, uh, if you have like a provenance ledger behind that, then you can try to find it out and if uh, some of the players are not good playing good, then others can distrust them. Yeah? This is kind of the web of trust idea mm -hmm. inverted, so it's web of distrust to um, to this extent that you can record it publicly, uh, which is like then uh, something where you can say, okay, this, this guy has accumulated enough um, at least ideas that this guy is doing bad, so I will go and check. Yeah? Uh, and you could use, or this technology could use also for other, um, I don't know, cobalt for instance is one of the things then, uh, or other uh, um, rare earth materials that are uh, usually coming from Africa or from China, yeah, and India maybe, uh, lithium, something mm -hmm. else, yeah. Um, if if you think about sourcing and uh, exploitation, and you we don't want to exploit, but we want to have the right sources, but you have to prove it, yeah, or else there will be somebody in the middle who will might counterfeit the the sourcing information, yeah, and uh, this could also be an application. For Yes, so uh, I would like to continue uh, with the point about the cons of uh, blockchain. So uh, now, so we we were talking at the conference that we're doing open technologies to improve people's life and to make the world a better place. It's always come up the question. So blockchain uses a lot of energy, and and also so what what should be the stake of a socially responsible organization in regards to the questions? And before we, he we hear from our panelists, I would like to swap my seat with Jolin to have all the panelists here together. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, again, uh, the question is, 
Um, what should be the stake of a socially responsible organization in regards to the question, the cons of blockchain? First of all, the, the engineering and energy consumption. We should care. Yes, we should care. I don't have an answer for your question, actually. So the question again is, what kind of consensus mechanism is viable later on for not solving CPU and heat intensive problems? I mean, if you look at the, the inspiration behind um, you know, the two-thirds majority um, protocol, the name for it is the Byzantine General's Problem. It's a warlike situation. You know, that's, the, that's the social context in which this is, this is coming out of. <laughs> this was a, a so the Byzantine general's problem is a reference to um, military units in the Byzantine Empire that were very loosely coupled. They didn't trust each other. They tended to move towards a consistent goal, but the field commanders didn't necessarily trust each other. So if you're surrounding a city and you want to besiege it, you need all of the generals or most of the generals to attack simultaneously. If one attacks by himself, he'll get wiped out. So how do the generals agree how and when to attack? And it turns out to be provably the case that you need 3M plus 1, 2 thirds plus 1 uh, participant to agree. If you, have a, you can't make algorithms that work better than that. But yeah, whether you do that by burning CPU time or some other mechanism is, uh, I think, a really important question. <laughs> I think it's a terrible idea to build what amounts to a monetary system based upon uh, intentional waste. I think it's kind of um, well, slightly tangential, but um, I read an article recently about um, a bunch of crypto millionaires who landed in Puerto Rico, I believe. Um, it was the most bizarre. Was it? Was it Puerto Rico? So, I mean, this is like a small group of very privileged new millionaires who come together. Um, you know, to celebrate or to look at opportunity to use cryptocurrency in a not necessarily economically advanced uh, social context. And the qu I mean, they're, they're asking the exact question that we're asking here in this panel, what can we use the blockchain for to improve whose lives? So I think, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a legitimate problem because every decision making mechanism is biased by who's making the decision and, and, the, and the process. Whether or not it's a, a technical consensus mechanism in a, in a distributed ledger of blockchain transactions or whether it's a political process or whatever it is, that same problem arises. And so yes, we have this interesting, perhaps slightly unseemly um, situation where a bunch of guys who are not particularly sophisticated on you know, how societies work and politics and history suddenly find themselves immensely wealthy and sort of building what amounts to Galt's Gulch, for those who've ever read Atlas Shrugged, um, they're just sort of opting out of society because they can, and then trying to think what to do next with no grounding in how institutions work. It's an interesting problem. So, um, okay, so perhaps the audience has some answer for us. Um, we have... Uh, the remaining seven minutes, I would like to open the floor to the audience to raise questions to our panelists. And if you have any... Okay. Thank you, Nayana. So, hello. <clears throat> so, um, I'm, I'm Gilles Gravier. I'm from Wipro. And I'll be talking mostly about the same subject uh, tomorrow. But I, the discussion about the energy consumption, and, and it actually refers to the energy consumption of the Bitcoin miners on the planet. Not all blockchains are, are vast energy uh, consumers. Is a, is a very interesting problem. I, while I don't have an answer to this problem, I have some elements that you want to think about. First of all, it is extremely hard to store electricity efficiently. So when you're producing too much electricity in some places, it goes to waste anyway. So why not use it? That's the first thing. The second thing is, and that's from talking from uh, energy producers like uh, my colleagues at Energy in Germany, uh, we are going towards a world where we will be able to use energy from the sun, from the wind, from the waves, and we, we should be at some point able to produce more electricity that we will ever need for the whole planet. This means that the problem of overconsumption of electricity by anything 
is only a temporary problem. It's a lousy problem to have, it's a horrible one, but it's a temporary problem because at some point, it will not be a problem anymore. So uh, the point is not to say we should turn Bitcoin into a non-energy consuming environment or we should get rid of Bitcoin and do something else. The point is we need to move forward faster to a point where energy is not an issue anymore and it becomes a, a free for everybody commodity. And some energy producers are going in that direction today. But the thing is, I mean, if you look at how energy is produced today, um, then we have a vast problem. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, and if we just increase the demand at the current times, then the, the standard reaction will be either way we build more atomic reactors, yeah, or you just scale up uh, burning of fossils. Um, and uh, I would agree, I mean, Germany just decided to, to go out of the atomic uh, yeah. thing, yeah. And, uh, but still the others don't scale at the moment very well. Yeah. Or you move the miners to places where there's a lot of sun. I'd, so I'd, I'd, I'd question both premises for what you're arguing. The principal error is that the way mining, proof of waste based mining works is that it's self handicapping. So it autom on 10 minute intervals, this is not hypothetical, this is how the thing works. On 10 minute intervals, the handicapping factors that are used in the network are rebalanced to ensure that it remains difficult to mint new coins. That will automatically correct for all possible increases in electricity consumption up to several orders of magnitude more than the amount of sunlight falling on our planet. So that, so that the, the idea that somehow we will eventually have electricity too cheap to meter, which by the way has been announced at least twice in the past, uh, doesn't address the problem with proof of waste based systems that are self handicapping because they will always automatically uh, re-gear themselves to consume all the available electricity and take it away from other applications. So that, the, I, I don't dispute your broader claim about what solar energy and wind energy are getting cheaper and will keep getting cheaper, but the idea that that is in any way capable of solving the problem is, I would suggest, not correct. Because I, and right, and, and so Bitcoin will have to stop having it at some point or it will end up making itself irrelevant if this collapse under its own weight. Um, the other half of it is that although energy storage is relatively difficult, we're getting better at it. Um, and really there are two major areas, two or three. Uh, one is various kinds of battery. Uh, unfortunately, most of the lithium is in Venezuela. So the kinds of places you're going to want to make the conflict diamond problem, the principal place you're going to want to not take lithium from is where the lithium is. So. <laughs> We have a bit of a problem on that front and will have for some considerable time. Um, there are liquid sodium, uh, sort of, you heat metal during the day and then take heat out of it during the night. Uh, pumped hydro schemes are starting to look like a, a major player. So Australia's had one in place for decades. Uh, South Australia went dark uh, last year. In a, you know, an advanced country where an entire state, the whole grid went dark. It stayed that way for hours. Because the wind and solar renewables have come online too quickly. There's been a political drivers have been built to just say put more and more and more wind and solar source without any obligation to provide frequency control and synchronization. This is a technical argument about how grids work, but importantly the politicians didn't understand it when they wrote the incentives. And so you've now got some of the oldest, nastiest, cheapest and often second hand technology in use in South Australia, but providing more than a third of the grid's power. And that's a recipe for disaster. And so the Part of the solution to that problem is to get better at either batteries, which Tesla has stepped up and done, or pumped hydro. And it happens that South, a South Australia is physically the right shape to do pumped hydro against the ocean. So we, the, the storage problem is one that we've had the luxury of overlooking because we've used heavy spinning turbine based power stations, whether um, hydro or uh, burning hydrocarbons. Um, uh, we're having to rethink that as we step into wind and solar based systems. And so on the two fronts, one having those systems take responsibility for frequency control and stability as part of the business of selling power to the grid and the other getting better at storage. Both of those will advance and will advance fairly quickly over the next decade. So I, I don't dispute your broader point about we are going to have a whole lot more power available by solar and, and wind means, but the, the, on the two it's how that fits this problem. I think it'll be solved a different way. Yeah. 
So South Australia isn't quite the shape of Switzerland, but we, <laughs> there are enough hills near ocean to do it. So yeah. Thank you very much. I think we have time for only one more question. Thanks all. First of all, thanks for uh, your insights. So looking now to blockchain, basically 10 years of technology available. Yeah. What would be your hypothesis why this thing didn't made it so far to final application, for example, in corporates? I mean, in corporates, One sentence, yeah. the, corporates the technology is quite new and uh, from the idea it came up, um, it has not been developed so far for corporates enough yeah? because usually a lot of business models are uh, clinging to hiding kind of information from one party to another party and that is your competitive advantage. Um, so, and the uh, real idea in the beginning was everything is transparent. Yeah? So this is one of the major things and uh, technology does, I mean having technology enterprise ready is something different than having it just run somewhere. Blockchains on also. Yeah, just a quick one about the gap between theory and practice and the scientific method that actually you know, narrows the two. So hopefully there's room for improvement. On the blockchain technology, uh, it's good for the IoT in terms of the cost. Uh, it's because in some areas, the bandwidth is very expensive. If we use the central model, such as the cloud servers, so we use the peer-to-peer -peer model to re reduce the cost uh, without any central parties, such as the cloud servers. It, it's because uh, the cloud server is much expensive than uh, the total amount of sovereign's devices. Uh, blockchain, transaction blockchains on distributed hyperledgers are fundamentally new primitive. 10 years is a very, very short period of time. I would argue that the progress is not slow, it's fast. I, I can't think of an example, but you, ordinarily this would take 30 or 40 years. So I, I think it's quick, not slow. Okay, so uh, I think we come to the end of our panel. The final question for the panelists, you don't have to answer, just an open question, and also for the audience. So what can blockchain really help us have the world, what kind of problems the blockchain can solve. And if you are a developer, you are working, currently working on any open source of application that are useful for the world that using blockchain leads, uh, we would like to hear more from you. So the panelists will be around until Sunday. Uh, you are welcome to co come and talk to, to them at the end of the panel. Now let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much.